Hi everyone and welcome to another video by BioTeach, this time focusing on tissue fluid formation. This topic area comes up in the A-level biology syllabus as well as the BTEC Applied Science Level 3. This video is going to cover what tissue fluid is and which substances it contains. We'll look at the formation of tissue fluid in terms of hydrostatic pressure and we'll also look at the reabsorption of some of that tissue fluid back into the capillaries and how exactly that happens in terms of pressure as well as water potential. And overall, just very briefly, we'll look at the role of the lymph system. So the first things I want to cover are some of the key words that we'll encounter as part of the topic area. So the three words that I think come up time and time again and can cause confusion within students are plasma, tissue fluid and lymph. Now blood contains the liquid component called plasma and that's made up of water and dissolved substances. Things like hormones, ions and smaller monomers such as glucose and amino acids. When blood is pumped through the capillaries, water from the capillaries will get forced out and that surrounds the body cells and at that point that water is known as tissue fluid because it's entered the tissues. Now tissue fluid will bathe those cells um, and around 90% is reabsorbed back into the capillaries and the 10% that's left is taken into the lymphatic system and that's known as the lymph. Basically, plasma, tissue fluid and lymph are all related to each other, but they've got different names because they've got different amounts of components such as water, digested food, oxygen and waste products. The diagram here shows you the structure of the lymphatic system. It's very closely associated with the circulatory system by a network of lymph vessels that run through our entire body. The lymphatic system doesn't have a pump to pump the fluid around its vessel. It's not like the circulatory system, which has the heart to pump blood. Instead, any fluid that's in the vessels will be moved through the body simply by muscle movement. Now, if we take a closer look at these particular images here, we can see the association with the capillaries of the circulatory system. As blood is pumped from the heart, it reaches the capillaries. And you can see that there's this network of lymphatic vessels which surround the cells of the tissue. Now, tissue fluid is actually formed from leakage of capillaries. So tissue fluid will provide things like oxygen and nutrients to tissues, and it will also remove waste products as well. The capillary network is really important as it ensures that no cell in our body is far away from a supply of nutrients and oxygen. So let's actually have a look at what tissue fluid is. We're really just talking about the fluid that surrounds all cells in the body and it's virtually got the same composition as blood plasma. So it's got water in it, it's got ions, it's got monomers such as amino acids and glucose, it will have dissolved gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as some white blood cells. So the next thing we really need to do is look at how tissue fluid is actually formed. This particular image here shows you the arterial end on the left hand side and the venule end on the right hand side. At the arterial end, the blood will arrive at a high hydrostatic pressure and this high pressure is created by the contracting of the heart muscle, so the heart beating essentially. When the blood arrives at the arterial end, the pressure forces water, ions, monomers and some hormones out of the gaps in the capillary walls. Those gaps are highlighted by the kind of dotted lines that you can see on the diagram there. Larger proteins and blood cells will remain in the capillary as the gaps are not big enough for it for them to pass through. So this process is known as ultrafiltration and that's happening at point one on the diagram. At point two, we have the exchange of substances. So What's happening here is small substances such as glucose and oxygen, amino acids, will move with the water that's leaked out and will be able to move into the cells. Now, as water leaves the capillary at stage one, the pressure becomes reduced at the venule end at stage three. And also at the arterial end, remember we've lost water too because that's what's leaked out. So what we get is a difference in water potential between the capillary and the venule. So at stage three, some of the water from the tissue fluid will re-enter the capillary by osmosis because there will be a higher water potential in the tissue fluid because water's leaked out already at stage one. And there will be a lower water potential in the capillary because water leaked out from the capillary. 
So some of the water from the tissue fluid will re-enter the capillary by osmosis and waste products such as carbon dioxide will move into the venule by diffusion. About 90% of the fluids that are leaked out will go back into the circulatory system in this way, and this particular part is known as reabsorption. Point four on the diagram shows the close association with the lymph vessel. So we said 90% of the fluids that are leaked out will go back into the circulatory system. So that leaves around 10% that's been left in the tissues. And this particular excess that's kind of left will basically be drained into the lymphatic system and will eventually re-enter the blood at the superior vena cava. So we just call that the lymphatic vessels and how that fluid will drain into the lymph vessels. Now, there are actually two forces that will affect the exchange of tissue fluid. The first force is the hydrostatic pressure that I mentioned earlier that's generated at stage one. The hydrostatic pressure is actually generated by the pumping action of the heart because that will push the fluid or water out of the capillary and then it's known as tissue fluid. The second force that acts upon the tissue fluid formation or actually really the recovery of it is water potential. In the capillary, as the water's leaked out, it's lowered the water potential. So that negative water potential in the capillary at the venule end will pull the tissue fluid back into the capillary itself. Now, sometimes there's an excess of fluid that's left in the tissues, which basically leads to swelling, as you can see on these diagrams over here. You may have experienced this when you've been up on a plane for ages, if you've been going on holiday, and the ankles will swell up if you've not moved around very much. You may also know someone who suffers from edema as well. So that this is the condition that describes the swelling, and it can be caused by excess fluid leaking out the capillaries and not enough of it being absorbed or reabsorbed. Some of the exam questions will ask you about the effect of high hydrostatic pressure. Remember that the high hydrostatic pressure will push water and substances out of the capillaries. So the higher the pressure, the more water is pushed out. I wanted to include some past paper questions about this also. So you can see some of the key words that you need to mention. So this particular question is worth two marks. And what it asks you is to explain the role of the heart in the formation of tissue fluid. So if you can pause the video now, have a go at doing this, and then you can check the mark scheme and I'll walk you through it. So what you should have written down in terms of the answers for this is that it's the contraction of the ventricles that produces the high blood or the high hydrostatic pressure. That high hydrostatic pressure will lead to water being forced out of the blood capillary. You should note at this point over here that they don't accept that it's just the contraction or the pumping of the heart. They really want you to talk about the blood pressure that's created by the ventricles of the heart, specifically really the left ventricle, because we're talking about oxygenated blood being pumped around the body. Please also note that if you say that blood, plasma or tissue fluid is forced out, then you will lose a mark for that. You have to say that water is forced out. The next question here talks about uh, some people producing a much higher ventricular blood pressure than normal, and that can cause tissue fluid to build up outside of the blood capillaries of these people. And for two marks, you have to explain why. So pause the video now to give this question a go. Now, for the two marks for this question, you have to talk about the idea of more. So if you've got a higher ventricular blood pressure, then more fluid is forced out of the capillary because of the high pressure. And then you have to then say for the second point that there's less return of the fluid into the capillary or that the lymphatic system can't drain away all of the excess fluid. And so then it builds up um, in that particular area where the swelling has taken place. Again, just note that they will say instead of fluid, you can say water, but you can't say more tissue fluid is forced out. Fluid on itself is OK. And also you, you can't say plasma is forced out either. So it's quite important that you understand water or fluid are the two words that you can talk about when you're talking about the formation of tissue fluid when the capillaries are leaking. This last question over here is an extended response question, which asks you to explain how tissue fluid is formed and how it might be returned to the circulatory system. So pause the video now, please give yourself at least six minutes to kind of write down the answer and then you can join me back where I can walk you through the mark scheme. 
So there are six particular points that you can mention to get the marks for this particular question. The key words of hydrostatic pressure are quite important. So the first point should have been something about high hydrostatic pressure. The arterial end will basically force water or fluid out of the capillaries. It says there in brackets, reject plasma. So I've said this time again um, with the other questions that you cannot say plasma for this. You should also say that proteins and larger molecules will remain in the capillary, which then lowers the water potential in the capillary at the venule end. And that then allows the water from the tissues to move back at the venule end or the venous end of the capillary by osmosis. And then the final point of how the lymphatic system will collect any excess tissue fluid, which will return to the circulatory system. You could say that it's linked with the vena cava um, to get that particular mark. So hopefully that makes sense as an extended response question. If there's any of these points that you didn't get, what I suggest you do is write them in a different color in about five, 10 minutes after watching this video, you come back to that question, you attempt it again to demonstrate that you've key points about it. So that's all I have for you guys on this topic. I hope that that was helpful. If you've got any questions, please make sure you post them below in the comment section and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you so much for watching as always. Bye for now.